Right, uh, well, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to our fourth session on understanding and using radar data. Um, this is our last of the taught sessions, um, but we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of the month. So you'll be able to ask any questions about your own experiences or interest in using SAR data. Um, we'll send out a Zoom link for that after today's session, um, as well as a link to a very brief online feedback form, because um, we'd be really grateful for any feedback. It will help us plan future training and events. Um, and thanks for everyone who said um, you know, a lot of useful feedback by email as well already. Um, so in today's session, we're going to try some practical exercises on accessing and using SAR data. Um, we've just been, you know, had some good feedback that people are able to log in and use EarthBlocks. Um, and hopefully you've also all received the email I sent yesterday um, with the SNAP exercises. Um, if anyone didn't get that, message me in the chat and I'll forward it on. Um, the SNAP exercises are just one option and you can do them in your own time if you prefer. We've got the options of using EO browser and EarthBlocks. So Ian will go for that later on. Um, so I would just like to start today's session by introducing our guest speaker, who is Helena Sykes from Natural Resources Wales, and she's going to tell us about some applications for SAR data within NRW. Um, as before, if you've got any questions for Helena, please type them in the chat and then we'll answer them at the end. It's always good to have a bit of a discussion after these things. Um, so I'll just check that now everyone's got their microphones muted and their webcams off and I will hand over to Helena. So thank you very much, Helena, for accepting our invitation to speak. Great, thank you very much and thank you Ian um, as well. I am currently these days the Lead Specialist Advisor in Remote Sensing for Natural Resources Wales and I chair the Wales Government Group on Remote Sensing. But I originally moved to Wales because I was a PhD student in Swansea University, uh, I think it was still University of Wales at the time, in satellite radar interferometry using synthetic aperture radar data on two of the ice streams draining the West Antarctic ice sheet and I've just stayed in Wales, I'm on intermediate Welsh and I, I live here now. Um, I am going to talk a bit about a couple of applications from the NRW side of things and one from back in the day from my PhD. And hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see some links back to everything that Ian's talked about and also Crispin and Katie. Um, one thing that has had a massive impact on our work this year was the flooding in February 2020. We had these two storms back to back, um, very close together, and this is a picture. I'm getting a bit of echo, is anybody else? Um, I can hear you okay, it's nice and clear, but um, can everyone just check that um, you've got your microphones muted and I'll, I'll have a quick scan down the participant list as well and just check. Oh, brilliant, thank you very much. And um, this is Monmouth, the River Wye, on the 18th of February, which was the Tuesday of that um, stormy week. And you can see how high the river levels are here in Monmouth. Um, and there was a severe wood flood warning in place at the time, which is severe enough to be um, danger to life. I'm still getting quite a big echo of myself. Um, that's better. So Natural Resources Wales is a category one responder under the Civil Contingencies Act, uh, like the Environment Agency. So we are at the front line of responding to incidents like this. We had our highest river levels ever in some places in Wales in February and some our highest river levels since the 70s. So this was a significant event and uh, response work is still ongoing. Um, this was February and in March we were hit with COVID. So remote sensing has played a significantly greater uh, role in the response to the flooding and the review process than it would normally do when a lot more of it would be done with actual surveying and fieldwork. And I was contacted at the height of the flooding by some of our flood risk analysis specialists about what we could do um, with remote sensing. So the first thing that we did was we looked at the Sentinel-1 radar on Sentinel Hub. And as, I'm, as, uh, as Crispin mentioned, um, because of the cloud situation during the flooding, radar is a great solution for that to see right through the cloud at those longer wavelengths to see what's happening on the ground. So here we have the River Wye going down the screen um, from top to bottom. Um, I showed this to our colleagues in flood risk analysis. This is the Sentinel-1 data at its 20 meter resolution. And they felt that that wasn't quite enough, uh, that wasn't high enough resolution to do what they needed to do during that unfolding incident um, on the ground. So we had to start looking at alternative solutions to getting them the data that they needed. And one route that we did look at going down was activating the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters and the Copernicus Emergency Management Service. 
uh, through the, the UK Space Agency and the Cabinet Office. And what this service does is it can get you access to data at um, uh, from commercial providers that isn't normally free for free and for other satellites you can have them tasked so that if they weren't due to come over your disaster for another few days the space agencies that own those satellites will have them moved to come over as soon as they can and get the data to you and it is a big deal to activate this the UK does it on average about once every 18 months and what we would have done if we'd activated this would have been to chosen the higher resolution commercial radar data to look at those flooded areas in North and South Wales um, as the incident developed. Um, there's a couple of differences between these services. With the disaster charter, you get the raw data and you have to process it yourself, which is why it would have had to have been me personally activating this and dealing with the data um, if it had come down into NOW instead of flood or incident people. So it's good to know that that option's there, but it is sort of the, the nuclear option. And the thing that saved us from having to do that as the disaster was unfolding was the Sentinel-1 analysis ready data that's already been processed for UK government. Um, a lot of the complex and difficult and non-visual stages of radar processing that we've heard about over the last few sessions are done once for all UK government users and the data are then projected into British National Grid, ready to be brought straight into um, NRWGIS, for example, to be used with all our other data that's existing at the time and being gathered um, in the field and remotely otherwise during an incident. And this service, the EO Data Down service from Pete Bunting at Aberystwyth University, has processed that data to 10 metre resolution, including as a feed that can go directly into our GIS. And when I showed this to our flood risk analysis colleagues, they felt that that 10 metre resolution data was good enough, whereas the 20 wasn't. And that saved us from having to go ahead and invoke the disaster charter, um, which was a massive relief to us. And I'm just going to show you briefly a time series of what that what the data looked like. Um, just so you can get an idea of where we are here, you've got the Brecon Beacons National Park, the mountains up in the top left hand side. The bottom right hand corner is Bristol, you can see the River Severn there. And the red boxes are the areas that we've chosen as um, study areas for the training for the International Disaster Charter and Copernicus Emergency Management Service from the UK Space Agency. So areas of significant flooding during February. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but we've got Abergavenny here and Crick Howell and Monmouth were all um, very much impacted by the flooding and some of these areas down here in the South Wales Valleys, such as Pontypridd. So the way that these data are displayed, this is a three band image where the, um, the red band is the VV polarization. The, um, the um, green band is the VH polarization and the blue is the VV over VH. So you've got those three, three different um, polarizations of radar data that have been put together to make an image that can be interpreted by non-radar specialists, non-remote sensors, non-environmental people, um, just sort of openly. Um, blue is wet is what you need to sort of keep in mind here. So you can see by the 7th of February, we've got quite a lot of water building up in the Brecon Beacons area. Forwarding on to the 8th, the 10th, the 11th, things here have really got quite serious we know that all of that water has got to go somewhere and on the 16th it did so you can see this time step from the 10th where all the water's still up in the mountains pretty much down to the 16th it's in um town centers homes fields um lots of places it shouldn't be unfortunately uh this was the day that i witnessed the flooding in monmouth uh, along with somebody from welsh water on a sunday when neither of us were working and it was all um pretty drastic um, unfortunately, and then down to the 17th, you can see that the waters move further downstream on the uh, the Usk and the Y, and then on the 19th, things are more or less back to normal, and that flood water has uh, moved out of those areas where it shouldn't have been. So um, we couldn't have done this without radar. We couldn't have done this without Sentinel One. We couldn't have done it like this without the analysis ready data. And if we didn't have that, we couldn't have done anything particularly useful without going through to the disaster charter and getting higher resolution commercial radar data for our flood colleagues um, to use. 
another one of the key things that NRW is involved in is Living Wales, which is a three year circumrefunded project, uh, so Welsh Government funded at Aberystwyth University, led by Professor Richard Lucas. But uh, the piece of work I'm going to show today was done by his postdoc, uh, Carol Plank. Um, radar has been crucial in, in their work as well. What this project does is takes in um, sort of satellite data from various sources, various wavelengths, and process it uh, using sort of different algorithms for different features to create a series of environmental variable layers. So biomass, crop cover, uh, land cover, for example, at basically uh, field scale, as you can see there on the left. And for the crop classification, Sentinel-1 radar has been absolutely crucial. And what they've done here, um, the difference between this and other crop mapping is a lot of crop mapping is done using machine learning algorithms that require an extensive ground truthing data set. And as sort of a lot of remote sensing is hindered by, there just simply isn't enough ground data to give the confidence in that crop map that we could possibly um, get from other sources such as the Welsh Government data on what crops in the fields um, anyway. So the classification approach that was used here was parcel based um, and it was used, uh, it was based on the knowledge of different stages of crop growth for different crops at different times of year and it was done using a Sentinel-1 C-band radar time series. Um, they generated this nationally for 2018. Uh, we've zoomed in here on a little area on the south coast, just in the Vale of Glamorgan. So you can see the scale and the level of detail um, that this has been generated at. And they found that this method was particularly successful in distinguishing barley from wheat, which has been a major source of error in other crop map products available. And they found that the overall accuracies of this uh, were between 85 and 90%, which is really very good. Um, there are sort of several sources of ground truthing data that can be used for this. One is their own um, mobile app, EarthTrack, which, which records land cover um, sort of live from the field. And one area that NRW has been heavily involved in in this is the ground data collection. A lot of our staff are collecting data for this project and using the outputs that um, come out of it. And the first three years of funding are coming to an end. There's a workshop on the 3rd of December that will show a lot of the national outputs that have come out of this project, uh, including this crop map and several years of land cover. And we will continue to be heavily involved in this as the project goes forward and develops these products further and operationalizes what's been done in this um, research phase. So I'm just going to finish by talking briefly about a few things I used to do in a previous life. Um, satellite radar interferometry uses the phase information from radar satellite data to provide information, um, particularly the difference in phase between images taken in the same place at different times to show change or um, at the same time but from two different angles where that exists. And I just wanted to show you this slide which is one that I use in lectures quite a lot um, of satellite radar interferometry applications and the timescales that they're useful over. Um, there's a huge range of applications uh, across a wide range of environmental factors and the ones that you can see that have stars next to them are essential climate variables from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. So a lot of crucial work is taking place in um, interferometry. Uh, and back in the day, I was doing this on glaciers. Um, it can also be used for things like earthquakes, land subsidence, the stability of spoil heaps, which is um, a big one at the moment for a lot of people. But um, back in the day, I was looking at the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, there's not a lot of fieldwork in the West Antarctic ice sheet in general, and there's even less on the Evans ice stream. I met one person who's been there who described it as a vile place to work because weather systems with cloud move in from both sides and it's in terrible conditions all the time, making it difficult to work, leave your tent, get aircraft in and out to get yourself and equipment um, in and out of the field site. So there, there was very little known about this. So with the cloud situation, remote sensing was the answer and radar specifically um, was the answer to looking at this ice stream. Um, it drains about 10% of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is the more unstable side of Antarctica because its bed is resting below sea level and it's buttressed by ice shelves. Um, I set aside two weeks to do a literature review on the Evans Ice Stream and so little was published at that time that I finished it the same afternoon. Um, so there was a big gap there that needed to be filled. 
So looking at the, the radar data in the top left, the flow direction is going from left to right and up a bit, and the satellite track is going from sort of top right to bottom left. Um, the numbers here show that when I use pairs of images for these frames, that was the separation in space in meters. So it's kind of the same as photogrammetry. You need to view the scene from two different angles for interferometry to work, and you can't have that baseline either too short or too long to get a sensible um, sort of difference in phase to meters on the ground um, representation. And what you can do with this over, over a series of images is use a pair of images or another data source, such as simulating um, interferometry and interferogram from a digital elevation model to subtract the, subtract the common topographic phase for both pairs of imagery and get ice velocities. So we ended up with these quite nice um, ice velocity fields of the Evans ice stream here. And another key thing that we did was look at tidal change um, in this area. Uh, the fringes here represent complete phase cycles of change, so from naught to two pi radians. So the closer together they are, it either means velocity, which in the case of that band with the arrows, it's going up and down with the tide, or topography, um, such as if you can see my mouse pointer, this area around about here. And we were able to, for example, compare the amount of change that we could see in the interferograms to the modeled amount of tidal change that they that that we sh should be seeing, and see how well they matched up. Which fortunately turned out to be um, pretty well. And another key thing that we did was map the area where the ice starts to float. And this is an important control on ice sheet stability. Once ice crosses this line, it's already contributing to sea level rise, even when it hasn't melted because of the water that it displaces. So this really is crucial. And we found here that um, for about 100 kilometers down the length of this massive ice stream, the east side at the top of the image is grounded, so resting on its bed, and the west side at the bottom is floating, so not resting on its bed and going up and down with the tide. And that was pretty drastic and is certainly not what ice sheet models would show. So that was just a couple of applications from NRW and one from my previous life. Um, I always put this slide on because we do have massive amounts of open data in NRW that you can get to from this website and also even more data available for Wales from Welsh Government, including things like LIDAR that a lot of you on the line are probably interested in. Um, procurement to NRW is through this link and feel free to contact us in English or Welsh on this number or this email address and here are some links to our social media channels and a nice little video about what we do. Thank you very much, Helena. That was a brilliant introduction um, and covered some applications that we haven't talked about before. That was amazing. Really like the interferometry images. Um, I just haven't had any questions come in the chat yet. So I'll just give it a minute in case anyone has got any questions for Helena. Um, please, could you put them in? Um, and in the meantime, I was just going to ask, um, are, you looking, are you currently using or looking into using these interferometry methods for any kind of applications in Wales? I mean, I'm guessing sort of, I mean, land and vegetation ones rather than sea ice, I guess. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've looked into um, using it for things like um, mine waste, quarry waste, that kind of thing. But I think they're probably going to go down the LIDAR route at this time. Mm hmm. Because you're just doing a national LIDAR survey at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. So the whole country is being flown at one metre resolution um, over the next two winters in the leaf off period. And all of that data will be completely open. Fantastic. Um, and so there's information on this slide for anyone who's interested in that. Um, but I suppose the Sentinel-1 data could, or um, your satellite data, uh, sorry, SAR data could be of interest if you need more frequent data and updates. Yeah, definitely. And that's it's sort of that's one route I'd like them to go down um, for that application if they do take it any further. Brilliant. Thank um, you. Um, and I think flood outlines, again, are going to be crucial, particularly because um, the flood outlines that we tend to get after incidents are focused on the more urban areas because our remit is to protect people and property, whereas we're also looking at the environmental impacts of the flooding in the rural areas as well. OK, thank you. Um, I just had a question that's come in, um, or a couple of questions now. <laughs> um, and this is about the um, the Aberystwyth University, I think, analysis ready data. Do you have any more details about how the ARD is converted to 10 meter resolution and how long this takes? 
Uh, how long it takes no, you need to ask Pete Bunting. I'm sure I can find you a link uh, about the method, which mm -hmm. I can circulate after this. So to probably while we're still on the call. OK, thank you very much. And Ian, do you want to add anything about the conversion of spatial resolution? Um, that, uh, I'm, I'm a, one of the, it's a fantastic segue into the, the slides that I'm going to talk about. Um, oh, OK. <laughs> and that link between speckle and so I was also interested to know whether or not that was or, or whether it was a, a different mode of the Sentinel-1 or if it was um, reprocessing of the interferometric white swath mode. It's reprocessing. Of the interferometric white swath. Yeah. OK. Uh, and there's just, I think, one last question then before I hand over to you, Ian, for the rest of the presentation and the practical stuff. Um, has interferometry been used successfully for monitoring changes in vegetation or crop height? Not by us, but yes. Okay, thank you. If, if anyone knows more about that or has any links they want to post in the chat, then please do during the session. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. That's I hope you're going to have to invite me back for um for four more lectures to cover all of those On interferometry. Topics. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but they um it is it's not as as straightforward as as it might seem, and there's certainly you know uh, vegetation height and crop height. Um, you can sort of do it, and there's and there's multiple different ways in interferometry. Um, and it is dependent a lot on, um, so one, one simple thing, which, um, which I've done in the past is that you get short wavelength, um, like X band radar. So you can take a Terrasar X, uh, digital elevation, um, or digital surface model that comes from Terrasar X and it has a vegetation bias on it. Cause it's actually seeing the top of the vegetation. It's not seeing the, the ground underneath. Um, but fortunately in the, in the UK, uh, the Orden survey did uh, elevation data for all the ground surface, most of which was collected before they grew all the trees. So you can get the you can take the Orden survey digital elevation model and subtract that from the terrace or, or the tandem X uh, digital surface model, and you can get a, a relatively good estimate of the of the height of the forest. The problem is that that tends to come as a snapshot. Um, you can actually use we we've found. Uh, and did some work in CarboMap actually using um, the stereo imagery from Terrasar X, which was actually much more reliable and you could collect that much faster. It just, it becomes very expensive because you need multiple images and the and the, the quality of images that you, you need tend to come from the commercial sector. The biomass mission that is um, going to come soon is plans to do interferometry with P-band over forest vegetation. Um, the tandem L that the DLR um, are aiming to do will do interferometry. So that when you have these tandem missions, they're specifically optimized for doing for doing interferometry. So there's lots of things that you can potentially do, but it's not as straightforward. And one of the challenges with Sentinel-1 is that it keeps coming back. And if you remember, um, my video is on. If you remember that the, the uh, you're measuring individual waves and if the, if the target you're looking at shifts the um the waves that are coming back even on a scale of you know millimeters uh it messes up your interferometric measurements and and since even 24 hours difference between collecting images your your trees or your crops will have moved by a few millimeters it's really quite difficult if you do if you do it in a, a repeat pass mode so you want to collect the, the data at the same time and that's where the tandem missions become really um quite significant so there is there's lots of things you can do with interferometry um, for vegetation. We just don't have time to talk about them all today. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, also, thank you. That was a very, very good couple of questions um, from the audience there. Um, I just wanted to add that um, the slides from Helena's presentation will be shared after the workshop and also the slides from our other guest speakers, Crispin Hambridge from Environment Agency and Katie McPherson from the MMO. So we'll make those available uh, when we make the videos from these sessions available as well. Um, so yeah, thanks very much to all our guest speakers and I'll hand over now back to Ian. So I wanted to just quickly cover a couple of things which will help you when it comes to selecting data, but also understand some of these words. So there's strange words like looks that comes in uh, and, and also just understand a little bit about the challenges to do with spatial resolution and radar. So that um, uh, because what I, what I really want you to do is to do, is to do more and to get as enthusiastic about radar as people like Helena is clearly. Um, and I want you to get enthusiastic about it and 
and it's really important that you kind of already you understand some of the challenges before you get into it so that you're not disappointed. So the key thing is that we're, in terms of range resolution, uh, our definition of resolution is to do with the overlapping of, of um, targets. So when, a, when two point targets can't be resolved into two targets and they just look like one, uh, that's, the, that's the, the limit of your, of your resolution. And that's the same whether it's in time or space or, or frequency or angle. It's to do with separating out um, point targets. Uh, there's actually there's a, a fantastic little quote in them. Um, if anybody's seen the, the movie Miami Vice, the more recent one, uh, um, with uh, I can't remember the, the, the two actors in it now. It will come to me. Um, somebody will put it on in the chat, I'm sure. But uh, oh, Colin Farrell is one of them, and, and there's one scene that Colin Farrell is explaining why the uh, what the drug runners are doing, bringing in the drugs into Miami, and he he actually says that they're they're coming in in two speedboats. And they're um, they're bringing them in so close together that they just look like one target, not two. And it is it is basically that is the definition of, of resolution. That these two boats are so close together they just look like one boat. If they were far enough apart, they would start to look like two boats. You'd see them as two signals in the radar, and that that is when you've reached your your limit of resolution. In radar, it's, its range resolution is our, our fundamental resolution that we measure, and that's based on the timing that we're, that we're doing. We're really good at measuring timing, but the challenge is that we actually have a pulse that's got a length of tau, which is the Greek letter tau here. Um, so when these pulses overlap, that's when we're at the limit of our, of our resolution. So here's a, just a little drawing to, to illustrate the fact that the, the, these are two echoes coming back. So they've come in. The signals come in from the left. If you remember, that's my standard: is that the signal is always coming in from the left. It's bounced off these two targets, and these two pulses, because they have a, a finite length, is that just as the distance between these two targets is half of the speed of light times the length of the pulse, so essentially half of the physical size of the pulse. That's when they're just starting to overlap. So if they're, if they're larger than that, you'll start to tease out a gap between these two echoes coming back, and you'll know that they're two targets. Uh, any closer, and they, they completely overlap, and you can, they just look like a single target because you just get one very long echo that comes back. And this relationship, this factor of two, always comes in in radar because it's a there and back again instrument. Okay, the, our geometry is always there and back again. And so the, uh, there's always a factor of a half that comes in here. <clears throat> and the speed of light times the length of the pulse just makes that a physical distance rather than a distance in time. So that is our, um, that's our relationship, but that's, that's in the core measurement that we make, not in the distance on the ground, because in our oblique scenario here, we've got our oblique viewing scenario is that we've got to take into account the fact that the range, the de definition of our range resolution is in this this axis here. It's in the axis of time. It's not in the axis of the of the ground. So we have to take that into account when we are looking at the range resolution on the ground. And here, this little uh, animation is just to illustrate the fact that. The resolution actually changes across your swath. So the local incidence angle to the normal actually has an impact on the resolution on the ground because of this relationship of the fact that our range resolution is just in the slant range direction. And what that means is that these two targets here, because I've made this, this beam in this animation, I've made the pulse quite wide, is that you can see that the two pulses arrive back just so close together that you can't tell that there's two targets there. Further away, you can actually tell. And if you imagine extending this diagram well off onto the right, you'll recognize that we actually get better ground resolution the further away we are from Nadir. So again, it's one of these uh, features of radar, which is counter to what you would normally expect when you work in a, um, an optical remote sensing system, whereby you expect the, the best ground resolution to be directly below you, and you expect it to get worse as you get away from that year. 
Whereas in radar, it actually gets better as you get further away from, from Nadia. Now, if we zoom in into the, the grounds here to actually take a look at the, the geometry of that, well, what you don't see is, is me playing about with the annotation buttons here, which I always have to switch them off before I can click on the slide. But this, so that's, this is our beam coming in on the, the left. So our beam comes in here. This is our ground surface. And so the relationship between the, the resolution that we can do in slant range versus the resolution that we can do in ground range is related by our, our incidence angle. And so it's, it's a, um, a straightforward relationship between, so that angle there is the same as that angle. That's our opposite, that's our hypotenuse. So the sine of, of um, the sine of theta is equal to our, our opposite. So it's the row R divided by row G. That's our ground range resolution. So that's the one, it's, um, it's this one that we're interested in. So our ground range is equal to the slant range divided by the sine of the incidence angle. You don't have to remember the trigonometry. All you have to realize is that there is an issue here, which is that the local incidence angle will have an impact. And this has an impact is that if we go to looking at a slope, so if we're looking at the upward slope of our, of our little hills or our pyramids, for example, is that our ability to differentiate targets on the upward slope is actually now worse than it, um, than it is on the downward slope at the at the far side. So the local slope is the is the important feature here, not the the, the change in slope. So there will be a change in, in incidence angle across the uh, across the swath, but there is also changes in topography, and that has an impact on our um, on our spatial resolution. So we get poorer resolution on the the facing the slope facing us, and better resolution on the slope away from us. Now, in the context, just to relate that back to what um, uh, Helena was, was talking about, is that it, when you're looking at something like flooding, the, one of the key things about flooding is that it's, it's probably the reason that you're interested in that area and looking at flooding is that there is not a great deal of topography. And so many of these factors are less relevant if you're looking at very large areas and floodplains where it's quite flat. And so the, the topography is not changing. Your spatial resolution will be consistent across the area. And that's just, I'm just relating the, um, the, the C tau over two and introducing the sine theta i, which gives us what our relation, resolution is on the ground. Now, what we don't have time to talk about here is the, the very interesting things that you do in the, in the processing chain to actually try to reduce this number. Now, we can't reduce um, C, that's just the speed of light, but we need to do something here. And the, the quickest, the, quickest solution you might think is just to make the pulse length as short as possible. The challenge there is if you start to make the pulse length shorter, you can't get as much energy into each pulse. And one of the things that we uh, in a radar system is that energy is a, is a premium. Trying to get echoes loud enough to, to return to be detected means you need to transmit very large um, energy echoes. And you need to transmit pulses that are high in energy in the first place to get high enough energy echoes back. And so we have to do some clever processing to uh, to compensate for that and actually make that this this relationship we can make much better and improve this the spatial resolution. Now we touched on Monday just on the the, the process of uh, how we do the azimuth processing and the azimuth processing is done entirely differently and the spatial resolution in azimuth. Um, is really weird in that essentially the, the pure calculation of the azimuth resolution is equal to the length of the antenna divided by two. And that seems to be really weird because it has no relationship to wavelength. It doesn't have any impact by your flying. Uh, and it actually suggests that if you make your antenna smaller, you get better azimuth resolution. So there's so everything about that equation should feel wrong if you come from an optical remote sensing background. That's a whole nother two hour lecture to talk in detail about um, where that equation comes from. But the important thing for us here in this discussion is that azimuth processing and range processing are quite distinct and very different. And so often the, the pure 
resolution that is quoted for um, a radar image won't necessarily be the same in, in both the range and the azimuth direction. You might actually have uh, a different, so in fact, I think the spatial resolution quoted for the interferometric wide swath is actually five meters by 20 meters. And so it's got a different resolution in the, in the range direction as it has in the azimuth direction. The other thing that we have is speckle. Now, because this, the pure engineer will define the spatial resolution based on the separation of point targets uh, and speckle, um, you don't have any speckle on point targets, is that that introduces a challenge for us as um, applications oriented people because we, we're more interested in, in what it looks like uh, when we've actually got rid of some of the speckle. Um, and in order to get rid of the speckle, we have to make some compromises there. And we have to make uh, our compromises generally to do with averaging over a collection of pixels. Now, what we're going to do in the um, in Earthblocks, one of the first things we're going to look at is, well, one way you can average, average your pixels is that you can just average them over a long period of time. So we can, we can take, rather than just single image and, and spatially averaging it, which will reduce the spatial resolution, but will get rid of some of the speckle. Is that what we can uh, what we can do instead is actually take a long time series and then average each pixel over time, and that will also help reduce the the speckle. There are some types of targets where it doesn't actually reduce the speckle, but we won't worry about that um, today. But we'll look at some examples where the difference between a short time and a long time, and we'll spe see the difference in the image. But it does mean, so that's one of the things, and I'll come back to this in a second about what that implication has in our, um, in terms of resolution. The other thing that we mentioned was that um, the raw data imagery or the, the rawest type of file that you're ever going to want to interact with uh, has two numbers in each pixel. And so that's a complex number that's got the, that either is going to give you the real and imaginary component or it's going to give you an amplitude and a phase. But the key thing is it's, it's two numbers. And that's where this uh, SLC, what's called SLC is this what's called single look complex file. So it's a single look because it's got had no averaging and it's not processed the image in any way to reduce the speckle. So it's got the absolute maximum speckle. And it's complex because it is recording both of these numbers as a, as a complex number in each pixel. So if you look at the snap practical, you can, you'll can you actually download some uh, single look complex data and then process that into a, a ground range detected um, version. But one of the things that you'll notice in the SLC is that it's in radar coordinates. So the right hand image here is the geographic coordinates. So that's what it should look like with north at the top and square pixels. On the left, it's extended because the pixels aren't square and it's also flipped over because it's in radar coordinates. So it's just it just represents the data, how it's collected in the azimuth direction. And the range is it's only based on the uh, you know where it's measuring it from. What you want is output the geographic coordinates. And ideally, in fact, many of you will just be happy to get um, what Helena referred to as the analysis ready data. So getting data that has already been uh, terrain corrected, the pixels are in the correct location. It's all stitched together to just give you a seamless set of, of radar data. Whereas what you'll be, so one of the steps you look at if you do the, the snap practical is actually go from this single look complex data, which will only have, so it's only got one look. And the looks, looks is a strange term. Um, and especially because I spend a lot of my time trying to get students to think about uh, how ears work and the and audio perception and how bats and perceive their environment and using that as the framework to understand radar. Uh, and then there's this term which is all about that looks like it's related to eyes and looking. So it's not a very helpful term, but essentially what it is, it's inherent in the way that the, uh, that the radar can process the data. You can take the data and process it in multiple ways so that you can get uh, more averaging and reduce the speckle. And so the, you'll see that the um, the range spacing versus the azimuth spacing here, you, you go, that's your pixel size. So you go to much larger pixels, 
but you end up with um, a larger number of looks and that will get rid of the, the speckle and also make it square. So this is a step that you'll go through if you look at, if you do the, the SNAP practical. And this is just a quick summary of the types of data. So even for a single mode of measurement, and there are different modes in Sentinel, is that you get these different image files. So the single loop complex is the one that's really noisy. It's in the radar coordinates. Um, it's, it's quite a challenge to work with. And what you're more likely to work with is what's called the ground range detected. Okay, so that's higher resolution. Uh, it's already processed to about four looks. And uh, what I've said here is that there's only one number. So you've you've only got the the amplitude or the intensity of the of the signal now. You've got you've lost the phase information. So all that wonderful wonderful interferometry that Helena was showing you, you have to work with the single loop complex data. But for most applications, you can work with ground range detected. Or you can go for the um, straight to the analysis ready data, which will typically already be terrain corrected, and even sometimes terrain flattened, uh, and certainly put into a, a geographic grid, and often stitched together in, in mosaics. Now the link between the number of looks and therefore the speckle reduction and the spatial resolution, uh, we looked into this in, in this paper back in 2011. Um, and what we were interested in is how many, what, what could be a standard way that you could quote spatial resolution for a radar image? Um, so how many looks do you need? So how many averaging of the across the speckle uh, do you need before it starts to look like an equivalent optical image? And what we did is we took this test pattern and the test pattern varies in terms of contrast. So they, you can't separate out these individual lines at the bottom here because the contrast has gone to zero. It's also, um, you can characterize it as visibility. They're, they both essentially mean the same thing. And these bands of white and black get narrower and narrower. And if you look at a uh, single look um, statistics, so we've artificially put on single look speckle onto the, the test pattern is that you can see that the your ability to separate out these targets when the when the bands are very large you can be fairly confident that you might be able to differentiate those but when you get down to the narrower bands it's really quite tricky unless there's really really high contrast it's quite tricky even at this kind of level to to see what's going on at the at the finer bands and if you look at what the equivalent would be for a three look or a nine look image, is that uh, you can see that the as when you get to the nine looks, your averaging is such that you're you're at high contrast. You're actually doing okay in terms of being able to separate these out. And in fact, that was our conclusion: was that as a rule of thumb, if you work out what your radar image is going to look at at nine looks, you sh you would probably have something that's comparable to um, the equivalent optical image with the same space or uh, quoted well let's call it pixel size so it's it's important to bear in mind that just because you get a, a quotation of a, a spatial resolution and the GR, grd data is coming out at four looks okay is it's not going to look like the, the equivalent of an optical image so you just have to be very careful if you have high contrast you might get away with it. It all depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at ships in the sea where it's just a small um, handful of pixels that look very bright compared to the dark sea, you can might be able to get away with looking at this the higher spatial resolution and fewer looks. But if you're looking over like um, especially land surfaces and you're trying to look at things like um, mapping vegetation cover or agricultural crops, then our recommendation was that you really need to be looking at data that's at least nine looks. So this is just a summary for um, in terms of what you know what looks are that that strictly speaking they're actually they're sub images of the of the radar. We can process the radar in different ways um, and average it actually in the radar processing. In practice, what is it also contains some spatial averaging, and that it is. Uh, and what you look out for is what's called the equivalent number of looks, which is essentially if you've done the, the multi-looking processing in the radar, that it's the equivalent of that. 
And ultimately, you're trading off spatial resolution or temporal resolution. What we are about to look at in Earth blocks is trading off temporal resolution. Um, but you can trade off spatial resolution. And one of the things of, of why you should always use a proper uh, speckle filter, not just a, um, an, a mean filter, is that things like the Lee filter actually try to take into account the spatial variability to try to over, average over um, features in the image that, that look the same. So it tries to find the boundary, the borders between high contrast areas and then not average across them, but actually average into the, the more homogeneous areas. The topic of speckle filtering um, can go into very, very elaborate uh, types of speckle filtering, which actually look at the statistics of the um, of the speckle, so as to find the areas that are homogeneous and almost like a cartoon model. So everything is made up of cartoon blocks, and then only average across across those blocks, and that reduces the speckle, but tries to maximize the uh, the detail and the features that you can see. Not necessarily the spatial resolution, but the the uh, at least the edges and the um, and some of the features. <clears throat> 